Hi, everybody. We're going to have a phenomenal conversation in just a moment here with Christopher Bache, who I consider to be, and I know he'll be blushing if I say this, but really a hero of our times for being willing to take on a journey that most of us would not be able to withstand to find out about the nature of consciousness, the mind of the universe. In his book, LSD, The Mind of the Universe, he shares with us his experiences of some, I think, 73 different journeys he did with a very prescribed protocol and with someone sitting with him and protecting him over decades to be able to journey uh, sequentially further and further out into what the future of humanity looks like. So here we go. Meet Christopher Bache, if you don't already know him. Hello, Christopher. It's so good to see you. Hi, Regina. How are you? I'm doing well. I'll tell you, um, I say that uh, very sincerely after reading your book and uh, the other people who I know who've read your book as well, the question that comes up about halfway through is, why in the world did he continue? When you went through that much pain, that much suffering, enough that it took months, even a year to recover from a journey, but you would come back, you were relentless in your search. So to just set it up really briefly for people. What made you do this? You're a professor of theology, philosophy. What made you go on this journey starting way back when? At first, I think it was a foolish uh, strategy to push it as hard as I did, but I didn't know any better at the time or I was young and stupid. Uh, but I was trained as a philosopher of religion with a passionate desire to understand the deep structure of the universe. I had studied some of the great minds in our Western philosophical and Eastern traditions. Uh, when I found this methodology that Stan made available, I just decided to push it as long and as hard as I could. And I, there was a great deal of suffering on it, episodically and periodically. But at the end of every episode of intense suffering, there would be a breakthrough into an episode or phase of deep ecstatic bliss and, and deep transpersonal encounter. And the value of those insights and that ecstasy balanced out, more than balanced out, uh, the transient episodes of suffering. In the beginning, when you first started the journey, the very beginning part was um, what you title in the book, and it took you 20 years or so after all these experiences to finally write this book and put it out for the rest of us, it was called The Death of the Ego. And while you were in the midst of it, you were saying, what was I thinking? So <laughs> let's just set it up with what that very first, and we only have about 45 minutes. People are going to have to read the book themselves. We're going to hopscotch through the phases you went through. But let's start with what was I thinking? What happens upon the dissolution of the ego? If you want to allow your consciousness to expand into the broader dimensions, the deeper dimensions of consciousness, you must surrender the narrow bandwidth of your individual body-mind ego. And so this happens slowly or fast, convulsively or smoothly, but that identity that we hold has to be shattered, has to be kind of destroyed. Uh, and when it's destroyed, then your consciousness just naturally expand, expands into a deeper register, a wider spectrum of consciousness. If you do this, if your journey continues repeatedly, as we'll get to, you go through many such death sequences, uh, but it's not repeating the original ego death. The original ego death is kind of the first transition from your time-space identity into a deeper spiritual experience of the universe. Thank you for that. And um, on the subject of death, as you come to say toward the end of the book, you relished the death process. By the end, death was something you looked forward to in each one of these journeys because it freed you so much from all of the constraints in terms of consciousness. And so we'll, we'll build up to that. But one of the parts you went through was you became a woman. You started experiencing the life, birthing yeah. all these elements of being a woman, which was part of your identity is to be a male, to be an academic, and so forth. Just briefly, what was your experience? What did that do to you when you suddenly yeah. connected with the female experience after being male? About two and a half years into my journey, about 10, 11 sessions, and the universe put me into this situation where I could experience nothing except from within feminine 
identity, a feminine identity. And it was an, a feminine form, a womanly form that was the exact opposite of my own uh, male, academic, intellectually oriented form. And it was totally terrifying to experience myself being me, but not being me within a framework that I'd ever known before. And it just snapped me. And so when I let go um, and I yielded, then I became hundreds, potentially thousands of women and was given a, a journey into the world of women under the arm of the Great Mother. And it was an ecstatic experience, a wonderful experience. In fact, when it opened, I thought, what was I so afraid of? You know, what was going on? <laughs> Why was I afraid of this? This is marvelous. Uh, and what was the universe was doing was uh, it was basically teaching me that where I was going, gender does not exist. So all gender, all roles based on gender and any aspect of my historical personality had to be surrendered if I were going to experience more intimately what is there in the universe. So I would ask you this on behalf of the men and women watching this, what was the most either terrifying or irritating and difficult part initially of being confronted with a woman's reality? The most terrifying part in the beginning was it just wasn't my reality. It was a reality, but it wasn't my reality, and I couldn't get out of it. I was trapped within a, a feminine mode of experience that just wasn't me. Uh, there was nothing inherently frightening about it. And then when I let go and flowed with that experience, oh, what a... It was like having half of the human race open to me that had not been open to me before. Now, I believe in reincarnation, and I believe we've been men and women many times. So there's nothing foreign in that way. This was different. This was kind of opening almost into, I don't want to say an archetypal dimension of womanhood, but certainly to the, the collective uh, life being lived by women uh, in history, in time. So the joy was just to experience a whole different way of being alive than I had known as Chris Beige. As the academic, as, as the, the male, academic. engaging in academic conversation, and here you're dealing with a very different kind of connection and flow between women. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating. It's an interesting part of your book. <laughs> I wish every man could have an experience like this. It, it truly, it does change things profoundly. You know, and the other way around, and women should have the other. So we understand what each other is contending with in our bodies in this reality. So let's move forward to session 11. And this, there much has happened since then. Time has passed, of course. But when we go into session 11, it really becomes about archetypal, deep mass suffering that you had to go through, witness and experience. And if you could tell us what that body of body of memory, collective memory felt like and what it looked like to you, that would be helpful because we're still in it. My transition from an ego death process, which is very personal related to what came over the next two years. So it was a series of excruciatingly difficult, uh, horrendous waves of, of vast landscapes of human suffering, war, violence, uh, just unimaginable suffering. Uh, it was transitioned by an experience called the killing of the children. And I just want to mention that because it's an important signal. In between those two, I had this experience of being an old woman confronting soldiers who were just killing thousands and thousands of children, just smashing their heads on rocks, just terrible, terrible ordeal. And I think this experience was given to me to prepare for me for what was going to come, this ocean of suffering phase. That is, it awakened a depth of compassion in me, which I think was embedded at a soul level, uh, to prepare me to take on the work, which is something my soul had chosen to do in this lifetime. What I learned was that just as individual trauma gets buried in our individual psyche and can compromise our individual health, the trauma of history is buried in the collective psyche of humanity. And uh, so anything which is not resolved by the species in any one generation accumulates in these massive memory structures that I call metachoic systems. 
And what I think was happening was that something guiding my sessions began to use my sessions in order to confront, absorb, and transmute vast territories of collective anguish that were embedded in the collective psyche, meaning the patient stopped being Chris Beige. And in some way, the patient became, became some aspect of the human species. So with that, I want to ask you about something in, in, that's happening currently. We have all of this um, going on in the Middle East between Palestine and Israel. Mm-hmm. And we have collective uh, side taking. We have collective anger, depression, anxiety all occurring. And we have a propensity toward people who have been um, have proclivities toward prophecy to look at this as the end times, whether it's a Christian community waiting for rapture, whether it's conspiracy groups saying, no, this is a planned end time for humanity. We get into these end time stories that start circulating. But I want to ask you, having been through what you went through, you have this overlay to it in your psyche that I'd like to know about. Could you tell us how you see these times laid into what you went through? jumping many years ahead in my work. And I summarized my experiences of our time in history, what's happening underneath the surface, where we're going in a chapter called The Birth of the Future Human. And there I was given a number of visions over many years of humanity coming to a turning point, humanity coming to a spiritual breakthrough, an evolutionary turning point, a shift in the plate tectonics of the collective psyche. And then eventually in 1995 was taken in a very deep experience, dissolved into the species mind, dissolved into what I call deep time, being taken into the future and where I experienced a death and rebirth process of the human family altogether, not as an individual, but the death and rebirth of humanity. It was a global systems crisis that was seemed to be precipitated by a series of escalating ecological crises. Now, beyond that, I wasn't given any details about it. I wasn't given dates. I wasn't given any specific, nothing about artificial intelligence, nothing about a third world war, nothing like that just the experience of the human family going through a prolonged period of an absolute loss of control and a collapse of everything they had considered the normal and necessary goods or or, or standards of their world. Ever since that time, I've lived with this awareness. And for me, it's not a a projected fantasy. It's not something which I envisioned. It's something which I experienced. So for me, I can't, I don't question the truth of it. So I experienced this period of history as a period of increasing a destabilization and increasing escalation of conflicts and uh, breaking down all our norms. And our norms and con- conflict between races, conflict between religions, complex between conflict between sexes, between classes, all the tremendous things that we've been doing to each other, terrible things over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We have to go beyond where we are and grow spiritually into the next form that's emerging, I think, in an evolutionary sense in the human, as the human form. So I think this is what we're going into. That's why we're beginning to experience so much destabilization. And I think what's happening now is not in any way uh, a final or turning point or any final register. I think we're going, we're in a process which will continue to deepen for decades and decades to come. So this is, I think, just the overture uh, of what's coming and the terrible events unfolding in the Middle East and other countries, in many African countries, other places in the United States, these are bringing to the surface age old hatreds. And we have to transform these hatreds. And and I don't offer any political, social solution to the events we're looking at. My perspective is not at the ground level. My perspective is from the level far above the earth looking at the long evolutionary trajectory forms. Thank you for that incredibly thoughtful and articulate answer. 
And now what we'll do, because we did jump ahead a bit there, which we'll, we'll work our way back toward. There are some other things in there. But let's go back now to session number 15, where you learned about karma, because all of this has karma embedded in it. You learned about the essence of karma. And tell us what you learned about karma at that time. I had already, I mean, I was an academic and I was a professor of religious studies, so I had an intellectual understanding of karma, which is simply cause and effect generated by choices that we make. There are physical cause and effect processes, and there are psychological cause and effect processes. And in the traditional worldview of, of karmic thought, every choice we make sets in motion a series of events, which eventually we receive the consequences of, we receive the effects of. And by receiving the effects of our choices, we learn from those choices and we make a new set of choices. What I learned in session 15 wasn't so much a theoretical interpretation of karma, because I had that. It was a seeing and being shown the karma of my particular life. I went through a series of sessions for a year, over and over again for seven, seven sessions, where I experienced the entirety of my life from beginning to end as a happening as a totality, as a finished complete totality. And this is my first entry into what I came to call deep time. And in that context, when I looked at relationships, my the relationships around me, my people, when I looked at the issues that I was working with in my in my professional life, I could see how deeply embedded they were in a deeper series of karmic causal processes, that my position in history was not accidental, the people I was with were not accidental, it was a meaningful fabric. Then the question became simply, how do you respond most effectively to a meaningful fabric that your life is part of? Okay, that brings us to something that uh, I wasn't going to ask you about, but it seems like the right point. Um, you just spoke about every decision we make has an effect. And so yesterday, two days ago, um, a book was released by Dr. Robert Sapolsky, and it has to do with the science of living with no free will. The title is something like that, as I recall. But mm -hmm. essentially, he came to the conclusion that there is no such thing as making a decision in free will, that we're machines and we cannot lay anything that we do upon ourselves any more than we would any other machine. Yeah. So I would love for you to respond to that. Well, I haven't read that book, of course. And so no just judgment. came out. Yeah. And uh, but that's a very familiar position among my philosophers in my department, among philosophers in general. And it derives from a vision of the universe, which is based upon a kind of a 19th century metaphysics, which sees the universe as a machine, as a deterministic machine, and all the parts are determined by the larger movement of the whole. And we have no freedom. But I think that's a deeply outmoded and outdated vision of reality. A quant we're now looking in a quantum world. We're in a world which values indeterminacy, that there is a, there's much more flexibility in, in, in the system than we had previously thought. 96% uh, of the entire of reality is dark matter or dark energy, and we don't know anything about it. I think if we just step back, it's clear that much of our psychological life is clearly highly conditioned. But within that highly conditioned context, we make choices, and the choices we make can increase the conditioning or it can reduce the conditioning. Exactly. And we can increase our freedom but nobody exists in pure absolute freedom, uh, except perhaps the awakened, the fully enlightened beings, but we can increase the freedom by skillful choices. I hope you're enjoying this video because if you are, there are dozens more like it on my site, all supported by people like you. So if you'd like to keep this work rolling in and join our community, just click on the Patreon button at reginameredith.com. That also gives you access to insider commentary, my live book club, and other live events with special guests. So join in. Thanks. I was very disturbed because the media picked right up on this, and he, he got a loudspeaker off of this one. I thought, this is so archaic, and it essentially archaic. saying we have no self-responsibility either. Uh, yes, we can't take credit for the best of us, but we also don't take credit for the worst of ourselves. We have no part in what we do as acting as machines. I thought, 
like you, how outdated is this, um, considering the quantum reality that we're becoming aware of? So one thing I wanted to read out of your book, because your talk is, this feeds into it, the notion of us, we have a soul, <laughs> we have something that transcends this physical reality, which that author does not recognize, by the way. So you, in when at the end of the karma, it says energy started must simply complete itself. And that's the nature of karma. So then I go into this area that I chose um, where you're defining the soul itself, because a lot of people wonder what, what is it I'm made of, you know, at the most, the most etheric, most uh, sublime part of myself. It says a story of individual consciousness ultimately sourced in the creative intelligence of the cosmos, systematically moving back and forth between the physical universe and a surround metaverse in a long journey of self-development. I think that's one of the best definitions of soul and the one I probably relate most, relate most strongly to in my own system of understanding. Anything that you care to add to that so people can understand that this soul is here for expansion, experience, choice, um, and anything you'd like to add to that in terms of you, what you came to understand is what our soul is and what it's here to do. Just as we have a center of integration that integrates all of our experiences from this lifetime, and we're not quite sure how to describe that or what it is, but it's we know what it what it feels like and what we can we can understand it. The soul is simply a center of integration that integrates all of our experiences from all of our lifetimes and our times in between our lifetimes. So it is a center of integration that is a learning system, is part of a learning system, which is continuously growing, continuously expanding and deepening. And if we ask, what is the essence of what that consciousness is? Classic spiritual traditions have said the essence of every individual, the soul, is the essence of the totality, Atman, is Brahman. The essence of the soul is the essence of the divine. For me, uh, the form, if in my deepest experience of the form of the soul and the form of all reality, is light. It's light, but not light, you know, not light as we experience it in the physical world, a much more profound form of light. It is light, but it is light which is self-aware and learning over vast epochs of time and continuing to evolve as it learns. And I think we are coming in the time to a, to a transformation which is going to change. I, I think we are actually giving birth to the soul inside time and space. That is usually we die, we expand to the soul, we incarnate, we contract to ego, we die, we go expand the soul. And if we just keep that up for a few hundred thousand years, <laughs> Sooner or later, I think the soul, the integrated consciousness we return to when we die, manifests or wakes up inside the individual human being. And that's what I call the birth of the diamond soul. Mm. Literally wake up inside physical existence. I think that is the, the challenge that we are facing in this century. We no longer have the luxury of trying to run this planet based on the experience of the, of the, or the psychological structure of individual ego. The ego is a magnificent entity, but it's limited. It's cut off from each other and from the larger universe. We need to grow up fast and grow up in this case is to awaken to the soul that we already are but we haven't experienced fully inside time and space. Well, that's an understatement. <laughs> yes, we do need to wake up fast. And go. so now we come to a point where you had a, a session, and after that, you did not have another one for six years. You quit for six years. Just briefly, a synopsis of the session, why you stopped for six years, and what happened when you picked it back up, because that's the fascinating part to me. I stopped for six years because my wife, who was my sitter, asked me to. Too many things were coming up out of my sessions that were very novel and disruptive, and she just wanted the whole thing to slow down, and she asked me to stop, so I did. And then when I resumed, I always knew I would resume, and when I did resume six years later, 
uh, I had my wife's support and she continued to be my sitter through all of the remainder of my sessions. So it was a, it was kind of a husband wife negotiation. I, yes. And the other part I found interesting is that when you pick back up six years later, you you're being picked up at the exact same spot you left off. Yeah. That was striking because I was in the middle of the ocean of suffering work. So I was going yes. to horrendous suffering six years later, different period of my life, uh, different expectations in different astro astrological aspects. It, my sessions began exactly where it had stopped and continued to deepen the ocean of suffering for another year. Uh, meanwhile, but in the ecstatic portion of my sessions, when I had stopped, I was doing this, you know, experiencing the whole of my life from start to finish, boom. Now, I left all that behind and I was going into a uh, subtle structure reality and being given a crash course in cosmology, how the universe works. And then we start going to lessons 25, 26. I was absolutely fascinated with, mm -hmm. I, I just, I was trying, but I was trying to read into it through my own lens and, and filter of understanding. And that was, you were out in the cosmos and you started encountering fast beings, fast beings that were almost like galaxies in and of themselves. And none of us have ever seen this or felt this or experienced this. Maybe just give us a glimpse into what the what seemed to be the makeup of these beings. But the thing that fascinated me was that you said these beings live through humanity, experience through humanity, love through humanity. Fill us in. I've often had kind of reservations about that particular line in my sessions, but I kept it in because it's in my original notes. When the ocean of suffering came to a culmination and exploded me into a deeper level of consciousness, the distinctive quality of this level of consciousness is two things. It was incredibly old, ancient, ancient beyond anything I'd ever imagined before, very, very old. And it was more real than time and space. So I was being catapulted in what I eventually came to understand as archetypal reality, which is a level of reality which is historically exists before time and space exist and contribute some of the fundamental structures of time and space. So the vision here is that all of reality emerges out of a primal one, which starts as a void and manifest in the form of the Big Bang. But in between the one and even the Big Bang, there are many gradations of being, many unfoldings that take place of the divine, though I, I don't like to use that word because we have so many connotations of the divine mm -hmm. I want to go with. But, and there are many, many layers, and our lower levels are sourced in the ac actions of higher levels. Uh, and so I was encountering these, I, I don't know whether to call them beings or principles, but vast, vast beings. And other people have experienced them too, because uh, I think it's a universal structure we're bumping into. The very best my mind could do to give it form was to see them as galaxies because I've you know, watched the Hubble telescope and the James Webb and we see these galaxies that are billions and billions of light years across, so big we can can't even imagine them. And my mind was using those images just to give a picture to these beings that were not galaxies, but they have that massive scale. And these beings were part of the process of creation, creating the uh, time and space and some of the structures within time and space. And far, far, far down the line, we have human beings. And the insight here was that in some way, all of human beings, and actually all of existence, was an expression of the intentions of these deeper cosmological principles and cosmological beings. And in some way, I'm not sure that I got all of the pieces lined up correctly there, but I, I do think that all of human experience, male, female, all versions of human experience are aspects of a species intelligence. And that species intelligence is an aspect of a planetary intelligence, which is an aspect of a solar system and a galactic intelligence. And there's a way in which 
this, these deeper intelligences manifest as our lives and they are experiencing the world as, as we experience the world and they're experiencing the adventures that we are having as, as we have them. So that would bring us to the question then that our experiences, and again, we're looking at everything. We're all watching this through our mind, through an egoic lens, uh, all the filters of our past. So each one of us is hearing this the way we will hear it. But it makes us wonder if we're kind of the end, toward the end result of these vast systems of consciousness, intelligence, desire, and creativity, how much of what we're expressing in the world is sovereign at all. Well, you know, when I experience this embeddedness in these higher orders of, of creation, uh, I never experienced it in any way being manipulative, and I never experienced it as being a, a, representing a compromise of my individual agenda, individual freedom. I experience this downward flow of causation but as part of a, a profound, gracious, uh, compassionate, intelligent process, which was giving me and all of us opportunities to grow and develop that we might not, not otherwise have. So it was, it, <laughs> we live in a conditioned universe at levels upon levels upon levels. And at the same time, it's a creative universe, which is constantly manifesting new levels, new things emerging out of our fundamental deep structure. Uh, and I, I just experienced this as I was seeing a complexity that had always been there, but I had not appreciated before. So whatever is happening has always been the way it's happening. It's just that we're beginning to be aware of what's happening. That gives, I've, you, thank you, gives us, mm -hmm. each one of us, we could just go over this piece over and over and try to get our minds around the vastness of it. Thank you for that. And also for sharing that it was filled with grace. I very much appreciate that part of the story. And another one we move on to is purification through um, reincarnation. But we're looking at groups of people, tribal um, epoch periods of history are involved when we're looking at uh, reincarnation, purification through reincarnation as groups of people uh, throughout history. Can you just talk about what that looks like a little bit? Well, my focus was not on groups of people, but on all of humanity. Mm -hmm. When I moved into the archetypal domain, I moved into first an encounter with these cosmic archetypes. And then I was dropped down into what you might call more of a Jungian level of archetypal reality, where I experienced all of humanity repeatedly as a single organism. And I was shown, given many lessons over the next year, that each of our minds were like a fractal spark within a, a species mind. Each of our bodies were cells within an integrated body of humanity. Uh, and so there was a continuous flowback system between from the whole of humanity into the specificity of each of us individually. And then the choices that we were making were flowing back into the collective, very similar to Rupert Sheldrake's morphic fields. Uh, theory. We tend to incarnate during different periods of history to purify a previous period of history, but we're doing it together. Or we're doing it as a species, you know, and as almost soul and tribal geographic groups. One of the things that happened in this period is that I began to experience, have certain visionary experiences of the entire human species incarnating as a single organism and each of our individual lives were cells within that organism. Previously, and I had written a book on reincarnation, previously I had always thought of reincarnation as the story of the individual soul's journey towards enlightenment. But now all of our, I saw all of our individual journeys, an aspect of its in collective journey. And so what each of us were dealing with was not just personal, it was also collective. It wasn't just this century, it was an expression of something taking place in a larger pattern. And I think I was given this teaching, uh, which went on for a long time, years, uh, in order to prepare me for the, what was beginning to unfold, which is this deeper vision of where humanity is in its evolutionary story, the challenges we we're beginning to face, 
and the death and rebirth and the birth of the next iteration of human consciousness, soul consciousness, diamond soul. We're going to get to the diamond soul in just a moment. I just have one more question I wanted to ask you before that, because this is a big one for a lot of people watching this. You had assumptions about reincarnation, and we all have assumptions about everything. You were learned, you know, your this has been your life's path is studying this. One of the things many people watching this have in common with what your previous belief was is that to reach oneness is the end of the road. The yeah. notion of oneness is the end of the journey. Can you tell us what you discovered when you finally found that oneness? Oneness is a profound truth. I mean, it is an absolutely foundational, profound truth, which is kind of a, a seminal understanding that runs through all the world's spiritual traditions. Uh, it's kind of a bedrock uh, because oneness brings us in touch with our essential nature, which is underneath the variability of our surface nature. Um, oneness generates deep compassion. When you have experienced oneness, you are naturally going to be gentle with everyone around you, including yourself. You'll be compassionate beyond measure. And to experience oneness is a profound step in our spiritual journey. But I don't think it's the end step. Sometimes the end step is described as dissolving into the, the primal void that precedes even uh, the manifestation of the physical universe. But in my experience, even that is not the end step. Should I give one comment that you made? You said it does not exhaust all cosmological truths. Yes. Yeah. And that uh, oneness is a profound stage in our development but the universe has been evolving for 13.7 billion years. It's gonna to continue to be evolving for billions and billions and billions of years. An individual and a species awakening to the truth of oneness, that's a profound turning point for that individual and the species life. But the evolution continues, challenges continue. It's not simply that we achieve oneness, we awaken, become spiritually realized, and we leave the planet, we leave the system and go into some type of off-planet paradise. Uh, we, oneness is a profound stage in our journey. I would start sounding like science fiction if I were to try to share some of the things that I've been shown about the magnificent being that human humanity is evolving into. Please go there. This audience is open to science fiction. The future human, which I think we are giving the process of giving birth to in history, the form I've described it as the birth of the diamond soul. This is a the future human is not simply a human being with a, an open heart, a healed heart and an expanded heart, which holds the entire world in compassion. And it's not just an open mind, which is able to take in and enter into deeper communion with the intelligence of the cosmos and incarnate that intelligence within their own being. But it actually transforms the fundamental physiology of our, of our body and our sensory experience. We have a tendency to have a mechanistic understanding of sensation. The eyes, light comes in, brain processes, senses, touch. It's kind of very mechanical. But in, in my experience in the sessions, it's not quite that simple. The more conscious we are and the more conscious we consolidate, and I'm talking about not consciousness, which is collected over experience over thousands and thousands of years, but the more consciousness we consolidate, it not only heals our heart and opens our mind, it enlivens our senses so that our eyes are in the process, our visual experience is in the process of becoming hundreds of times more sensitive than normal today. Our taste, our touch, our sexuality, all the physical senses are in the process of being transformed. And if we ask, how far can this go? You had an experience where you didn't understand what was going on, as I recall when I read the book, mm -hmm. where you were looking at something, but it didn't look as you normally saw it. I think you were looking at your hands. Is that correct? It was the very last session that was the 73rd session. And I was at the end stage of that session about five hours in. And I was given an experience that I 
came to call diamond vision. All of a sudden, my vision was a thousand times sharper than I'd ever known it to be. I could see things. I could discriminate colors and shades and textures. I was looking at my hands, and I was able to see every pore in every at the base of every hair follicle. I mean, it was just amazingly detailed. I could see dust floating in the air with great precision. I could count leaves on a tree. Uh, and then after about 10 minutes, it disappeared. And I was back to my ordinary, perfectly focused vision. And that's when I understood that I was seeing through the eyes of the future human, that the future human is a transformation of our physical sensations of our entire, so our entire existence is being polished, evoked, brought forward into deeper forms of manifestation by the universe. This is so beautiful. And that was, as I recall, it was session 71 through 73, where you were shown that this human being, this vehicle is designed for rapid transformation. And please expand on that a moment before we come toward our close here. Well, in the 70th vision, I was given what I consider the last great vision of my uh, journey. After that, it was kind of wrapping it up. But in that journey, I was taken deeply into deep time uh, and given three core experiences. And one of those experiences was an insight into how it is that humanity is actually built, designed for accelerated evolution. And it's basically we have the surface of our being is reincarnation. We incarnate, we learn, we grow, we change, we make decisions, we incarnate again, different. This is that part. But underneath the incarnate, our incarnating self, there is a deeper structure, which holds all of our incarnational memories, and is the fundamental blueprint, in a sense, from within which we, we act and behave. So that all of humanity is growing and changing, growing and changing. And there is a structure to the collective psyche, a very specific structure, which is accumulating and storing all this information. While we change individually, this deeper than individual structure is holding it. And periodically, that deeper structure goes through a change, a, a pivot. It's what I call a shift in the plate tectonics of the, of the collective psyche. I think it's the genius of creation that we learn at an individual level, but it collects at a deeper level and periodically that deeper level changes and after that shift takes place all individual experience is based on that changed fundamental psyche so that after we go through the birth of the future human all future incarnations of all beings all phys human beings will be operating out of transform this new fundamental collective psyche and it's going to continue it doesn't stop. So individuals learn and grow. It's collected at a deeper level, and that deeper level learns and grow, like Rupert Sheldrake talks about, morphogenic fields. And it's an ongoing, continually evolving process. And, you know, I've interviewed many, many people over the last 20 years in this particular role. And I do also interview people who channel other beings from other times and spaces. And one thing that has come up repeatedly is that what humanity is moving toward, it's a total overlay with what you're saying, is to this expansive being, this refined being that incarnates into the physical body, who's operating through the heart center as the primary influence of intelligence and that we this is a species that can end up and will end up being a model for other species throughout the universes is that how you saw it too once we can embody all of this you know there was just one piece one line in all of the sessions that seemed to indicate something like that i what i intuited was that earth was a hothouse Mm -hmm. growing a form of consciousness that would in time be exported to other solar systems in our galaxy. Mm -hmm. now, I don't think we're the origin of, of all life, and, and I'm sure that there is evolution taking place in highly developed forms in all sorts of solar systems and other galaxies. But at least here, we seem to be growing something which is destined, it seemed to me, just that one inclination seems to be destined for more than planet Earth. 
Well, I just wanted to say you have validation there from other sources who have given that information through to us. Now, it's a while getting there. We just have to trip through these times. Uh, I, again, I, I can't thank you enough for the courage it took you. We didn't talk about what you went through, but I mean, we're talking about life-wrecking consequences of taking such high doses of LSD that you say now was really insane to have done, but you didn't know any better. You lived through it. Thank God, because it really it really pushed you out there. And yes. I truly do not, I do not recommend no. this. I'd be much gentler if I were doing it my, uh, again. And I'd recommend a gentler protocol if you're going to work with psychedelics. Yes, yes. And you say that repeatedly in the book. So I, I recommend for people to really dive into this. We just touched a few places in the book. There's so much more connective tissue to this story of the human, the collective human being. And um, any final thoughts you want to leave us with today before we sign off? First, I want to thank you for uh, helping bring the message from uh, this work forward. Um Psychedelics is simply a protocol. It's a new methodology for accessing these deep states of consciousness, but it's simply a modern version. We have many protocols that have been accessing these deep states of consciousness. Psychedelics are not important. They're not the signature of this work. They're simply an amplifier. It's consciousness that does the work. It's consciousness that if we use these sessions skillfully, it's consciousness that really does the work that opens us to these things. So I would really, at the end, I would de-emphasize the psychedelics and emphasize the consciousness which psychedelics amplify. And there are many ways to reach that. Yes. Again, Christopher, thank you so much. And I look forward to meeting you in the flesh in the Gaia Studios, where we'll go over this, but start filling in some of the pieces we didn't weren't able to get to today, okay? Thank you, Regina. I look forward to that, too. Thank you. So everybody, again, the title of the book is LSD and the Mind of the Universe, Christopher Bache. And um, I can't recommend it highly enough. It, it'll take you to places that you never dreamed existed. So until next time, thank you for joining us here on ReginaMeredith.com. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And you might also want to consider joining Patreon, which allows me to keep all of this content free and available to everyone. And if you're looking for like-minded souls, you might also enjoy my online community called Our Neighborhood. Links to join are in the description.